So here we have my completed 8-bit breadboard computer as inspired by Ben Eater's design based on the simple as possible SAP-1 architecture from Malvino's book Digital Electronics 3rd Edition. And in this video I'm just going to be going through all the parts of this, what they do, and uh, what changes I've made from Ben Eater's design. Okay, so right up here in the upper left is the clock circuit. Uh, for the actual clock, basically the same as Ben Eater's design, we have a 555 timer acting as a clock which allows us to adjust the speed whereby we are controlling the duty cycle so you can see it's mostly high and goes off for a little blip and we can adjust between about 50% and 100% to go from 1 hertz to what I clocked at about 100. Um, Next up here is the 555 timer acting as a debouncer for the manual clock switch so that this would hang over for a little bit after I've pressed the button to prevent accidental double presses. Then this 555 here is acting as a debouncer for this switching state switch also to prevent the same type of errors. And then this right here is where I've changed things a little bit. Instead of three separate logic chips to do the function of a multiplexer, I just used one 74LS257 multiplexer chip which has an enable pin as well, so I can select between manual clock and the automatic clock. And I can also have my halt line just goes into this chip on this long yellow wire there. And when it halts, it just lets the clock float high, which stops execution for everyone else. And that floating high value sets this inverter to high so that I also get the negative clock held low. Um, and then the inverter, of course, is there to provide the negative clock for certain registers that need it, namely the flags register, uh, T-state reset, and the output register in my case. Then moving down the board a bit, we just have an extra register. This is the stack pointer register, which holds the value for the location and memory where the stack is located. Uh, just allows us to do things like use a stack with push-pop-peak operations, or maybe even later implement call and return Continuing down the board now, these three boards make up the main memory of the computer. So we'll start with the actual memory chips, which are right here. These are, instead of 74LS189, uh, 16 words of a 4-bit word, and two of them to have 16 bytes of RAM, I've used these 5101 CMOS RAM chips. They came from pinball machines, and although they're CMOS, they are specifically designed to be directly TTL compatible. I just found them on Jamico. So they have 8 bits of address space each, and each hold 4-bit words. So each one has 256 4-bit words for a total of 256 bytes of RAM, as opposed to the original 16. Um, up here, we have the register that holds the memory address, and I've displayed that down here at the input to the RAM in yellow. And then the manual select for memory address and the program versus run mode switch which would allow us to input a memory address manually and then go to program it. And then that is multiplexed into the RAM input by the 74LS157 multiplexers. Right here we have the interface to the bus for the RAM value. So this Octobus transceiver allows us to output the current value being accessed from the RAM onto the bus or take in from the bus and goes into these multiplexers along with the manual input into these multiplexers as well, which then goes into the value input on the RAM chips. And you can see that in the blue wires there. Then down here is the switch for manually entering a value into RAM and the reset switch for the computer, which simply clears all the registers and resets the program and allows you to run it from the start again. Next down here we have the instruction register, implemented exactly the same way as Ben Eater's instruction register where we have the Octobus transceiver and 274LS173s making up 8 bits of storage, a whole byte, and then the 4 least significant bits can be output back onto the bus but 8 bits come in from the bus. Then over to the left here is the T-state counter which is a 74LS161 4-bit counter of which I'm using 3 bits and some logic using 74LSO2 chip to help control resets of this, which are done by a control word uh, signal, T-state reset, as opposed to a uh, multiplexer counting to 5 and then resetting the counter. Right here are the 428C16 EEPROMs that I'm using for the control logic. 
I need four because I have a 32-bit control word instead of 16. And the way these are addressed is that the most significant 8 bits come from the instruction register up there, and the least significant 3 come from the t-state counter. So my instructions occupy a full byte as opposed to just 4 of the most significant bits in the instruction register's value. You'll notice that because I'm doing that, I can't have flags coming into my control logic, so instead of being able to access the flags when writing the microcodes to make the instructions, there's discrete jump logic that interacts with the flags to allow conditional jumping. The other thing I should mention is the obvious modification I've made to these ROMs. They don't look like normal ICs. This is because I've had to make modifications so that I can insert them and take them out much, much more. So, here, every time I have to reprogram them, I have to pull them out. So I usually just use this file and pull them up. And what I've done is amputated them and given them bionic legs. I cut the pins off, and then I solder these male headers onto what was left of the pins in order to make them more rugged. Now, if you're going to be reprogramming your control ROMs a lot, I highly recommend this modification because it prevents a lot of issues. It also helps them get better contact with the breadboard, so if you have not as great breadboard like I do, it'll allow you to compensate for that. Up a little bit right here, we have the output register, which is right down here, the 74LS273 along with an AND gate to control the clock. Just like Ben Eater did, thinking he would save chips, but it didn't actually save chips, simply because he thought, oh, don't have to output to the bus, so I don't need a bus transceiver, and we can just have an 8-bit register instead but it results in having to have this AND gate, and I've actually had to make this on the negative clock edge instead of the positive clock edge because I had some glitching with the AND gate. I think it's related to a timing issue, but I would not recommend doing this. Instead, you should probably just use 274LS173s so you don't have to have this AND gate and you don't have problems and have to put it on the negative clock edge to solve some timing issue. Right above the output register, we can see the actual clock for the display which is multiplexing through these so it's drawing one number at a time and then it's switching to the next display outputting that number next display outputting that number next display so on and so forth and it goes through and does that it's either 70 or 140 hertz per display so you can't tell the difference but i only have to drive one display at a time this is exactly how ben did it um where he used a 555 timer to generate that clock signal, uh, then a JK flip-flop to act as a counter, so dividing it by four for each display, uh, then this 74LS139 demultiplexer to go through the control bits on the CPROM here and select through the different displays that it will be outputting to, controlling their common cathode from the EEPROM. Then, instead of just two display modes, signed and unsigned decimal, I've added modes for hexadecimal, signed and unsigned, octal, signed and unsigned, and uh, decimal, signed and unsigned. Because I've used this bigger EEPROM here, the 28C256 instead of the 28C16. Now here a little side note about using the bigger EEPROM. The 28C256 happens to have write protection, which is great if you're trying to keep your data from being harmed. But this board that Ben had designed, the EEPROM programmer, did not like working with that very well. I would have had to redesign this board just to do that programming. And then disabling the write protection is a rather complicated operation. So I had tried to use one of these to make that happen. and. I thought that it would be a simple matter of getting the code right, but the Arduino seemed either too slow or wasn't writing the right addresses to disable the right protection. Gave me a lot of trouble. Put in probably about 20 man hours. So, this is $50. I highly recommend that you go out and purchase one of these. It's an XG Pro EEPROM programmer. They're about $50 on Amazon. Prime shipping. Absolutely worth your time and money. Because the objective was to build this machine, not to learn how to build an EEPROM programmer for something with write protection. Moving up a little bit, we have the B register, exactly identical 
as was in Ben's design. We have the 74LS243 octal bus transceiver, 74LS173 4-bit registers, simple register. Up here we have the A register, which is exactly the same deal with the bus transceiver and the register chips. Now here's where it gets a bit different. I have my output from the ALU, which goes through a bu octal bus transceiver, just like Ben's ALU, but my ALU does not use the 74LS283 adder chips. Instead, I use 74LS181, which is based off the 74181 ALU from the early 70s, before the Intel 4004 really came out and became widespread. So this allows me to do addition, subtraction, uh, and all logical operations. And then I also have a ROM up here, which I've programmed to allow me to do bit shifts and bit rotates. Now, the way I'm controlling this is that I have this ROM addressed by three address bits, L2, L1, and L0 on my control word, which tell it what bit operation to do. If they're all false, it's doing nothing. And if any of them are true, then these multiplexers here are taking the output from this ROM and it's performing some bit shift operation. If they're all false and we get anything else, it takes the output of these ALU chips and puts it to the bus transceiver, which can then put it on the bus or not based on the E, O, control bit. Now you'll notice I haven't used OR gates to do that selection. Instead, I've just used diodes, mostly because I was trying to save on chips and space. So I have these three silicon diodes on the... Um, bit shift ROM operation select which act as an OR gate and then the output is pulled down and that is what goes into the select bit for the multiplexers the 74LS157 just like the RAM before it goes to the bus transceiver. So the other big change is where the outputs for the flag register come from. On Ben's computer the output for zero and the output for sign come from the content of the A register here. On my computer, they're updated as the result of the ALU's current computation. So I have the sign bit comes directly from the output on the most significant bit of the ALU. The zero comes from inverting the result of ORing all of these together at the output of the ALU, and the carry comes from the carry output of the ALU. Um, you'll notice again that I didn't use a bunch of OR gates like Ben did. I took the suggestion from the YouTube comments and just used eight diodes. Particularly, these are germanium diodes for RF detectors. They're not exactly the correct choice of diode. You should use silica diodes with 0.6 volt drop, but they work and I haven't had a problem. So just soldered eight of them together on one side and ran that to an inverter and then into the flags register. Up here we have the flags register, which is just a 74LS173 4-bit register. I'm using three of the bits for sum on the left, carry in the middle, and zero on the right. And then these go into XOR gates as conditional inverters. Then the output of this XOR gate goes to the flag display and the discrete jump logic. The discrete jump logic basically just combines the jump signals and the flags or their inverted counterparts and decides whether or not to jump to the value on the bus. Right down here we have the actual control word. As you can see it's a lot bigger because I have 32 bits worth of control. I have control for the halt which would halt the computer, the t-state reset which resets the t-state counter whenever the instruction is finished. Control to input the flags, invert the flags, a carry in on my ALU, the stack pointer output, stack pointer input, memory address register input, RAM output, RAM input, counter enable, counter output, jump less than zero, jump carry, jump zero, jump unconditionally, uh, then L2, L1, and L0 talk to my EEPROM that I'm using for bit shifts. S3 through S0 are the operation control bits for the ALU chips. M is the mode select for the ALU chips. E out is the ALU out command. Instruction register output, instruction register input, A out, A in, B out, B in, and output register input. 
So now having looked at all of those parts separately, we can talk about what the computer can do as a whole and what I've added. So ultimately, I increased the memory from 16 bytes to 256. I enabled variable length instructions from anywhere between 2, the fetch cycle, and 8 t-states. I expanded the control word to 32 bits. My output can be hex, octal, or decimal, signed or unsigned with the expanded display ROM. I've enabled all logical operations, addition and subtraction, and bit shifts, and I've added the stack pointer register so that it can support a stack somewhere in memory. So that's about all the hardware there is to the 8-bit computer. In future videos, I want to go through this program that it's going through now, which is just a program to generate the Fibonacci numbers up through 89, which is the last Fibonacci number before the sign flag gets set, and I have it jumping less than zero back to reset the program. If you dislike this video, you know what to do. If you liked it, go ahead and do that too. If you want to see more of this type of content, go ahead and subscribe, and we'll go through that program next time, and hopefully we can write some other cool programs for this as well.